Hello, welcome to the Open Staff Workshop. My name is Anita Ruiter and I'm the Community Manager. With me, I have... Bart Leiter. I'm a Data Science Software Engineer from the uh, Short-Term Energy Forecasting Team of Aliana. Yes, and we also have two people behind the screens. So a shout out to both Frederik and Frank for helping us behind the scenes. <laughs> so uh, let's jump in. What are we going to do today? Well, first of all, we have a short presentation to just explain to you what OpenStaff is and why you would use it. Then, of course, we can jump into the workshop, which is the largest part of this afternoon. Uh, it has three parts. We'll explain during the workshop what this entails. So please don't be scared by if you don't recognize the terms uh, just yet. And in the end, we have 10 minutes to have a little conclusion of this workshop. So as we are with quite a lot of people, uh, if you have questions, please ask them in the chat. If they are relevant for a lot of people, are uh, behind the scene, uh, people will send them through to the larger audience. So let's start with a little bit of background, because I can imagine that some of you don't really know what exactly we are doing here. So we work at Aliander, which is a distributed grid operator in the Netherlands. So we distribute energy in both electricity and gas. And we have OpenSTEF. And OpenSTEF stands for Open Short Term energy forecasting. Okay, what is this? Well, this can be uh, the load on the grid, so uh, production and consumption on the grid uh, on a certain location. Well, up till now, we know what's ha what has happened, but as you can see by the question mark, we have no idea what's going to happen in the future. Well, this is where OpenStaff jumps in. As OpenStaff is able to predict into the future what is going to happen uh, on the load of the grid on a certain time and location. But why do we need energy forecasting? Why do we have open staff? Well, first, uh, we have a lot of challenges on the electricity grid. I think if you follow the news, you already have some ideas about this. So I'm asking you to write in the chat, what do you think the biggest challenges are before I just tell you? So let's say you have about 30 seconds to do so. I see a lot of good things coming in. Yes, great. So I see a lot of very uh, Good, complete answers. So flexibility, capacity, congestion, difficult to predict. Um, so yeah, really great answers. Let me give you a short recap of what we are struggling with. So the grid used to look like this. Nice and easy, not too complex. We, on the left side, we had centralized production. Then energy would flow one way to the consumers. And we as consumers were just consumer energy. And this was fairly easy to predict. However, currently, it looks more like this. This is, of course, still simplified. So instead of one centralized production point, we have decentralized production of wind and solar production. And besides being decentralized, it's also more irregular. It's difficult to predict, and we're not able to steer it. And also on the consumption side, we have some uh, additional issues. So consumers are also producers. I think a lot of you probably have solar panels on your roofs. But also we have a higher energy demand. This makes it quite difficult to predict. But not only that, it also means that we have capacity issues. So I think this was the most uh, named term in the chat, if I look at it now. So this is a map of the Netherlands, and it's the congestion map. So if uh, some parts of the country have a color, it means that we are not able uh, to add additional people to the grid. So companies or solar firms are not able to be connected to the grid because it just simply doesn't fit uh, over the cables and the transformers. Of course, we think in solutions and not in problems. So one way to solve this is to reduce your consumption or production if we expect an exceedance of the grid limitation. So an example of this is on your left. The blue line is your forecast. 
And as you can see, on one point, the blue line has a peak and it exceeds the grid limitations, which is the red line. So let's say that it's production and it's a location where we all have a lot of solar energy. To prevent this peak from happening, we can ask one of the solar farms to turn down their solar panels for this short period of time. Thus, we curtail and we shave the peak. The result is that the realized load does not have this peak. Our grid is able to uh, still work, nothing breaks. Great. However, in order to be able to shave this peak, we have to know when it is happening. And this is where OpenSEF comes in. We need accurate forecast in order to be able to shave the peak. Very shortly, what is OpenSEF? Part will explain in more detail later on. But OpenSEF is a complete software stack to forecast the load on the electricity grid. And these are automated machine learning pipelines. So that is an automated step-by-step -step process to make sure that we um, can make easily uh, good forecast. However, I use the magic buzzword machine learning. I can imagine that some of you don't really know what that is. So let me give you a short introduction into machine learning and forecasting. But first, for me, in order to know what the level is a little bit in the room, please just throw everything in the chat, what you know about machine learning and forecasting. So in about 20, 30 seconds, just write down what you think machine learning and forecasting is. Okay, thank you for your answers. So I see a lot of data, finding patterns, output is the function of the input, <laughs> training a model. So I think a lot of uh, very good terms. I think some of you, of course, uh, have an idea. For the people who don't, we have a 100 seconds video to introduce you uh, to the subject. Do you have sound? Ja, allemaal, want ze zitten midden in de woonwijk. Hoeveel duurzaam dat ze geworden zijn? Ze gebruiken van sustainability targets, want ze willen hun.
Okay, great. So to summarize this video very shortly is that machine learning is not magic. Um, and you actually uh, learn, a computer learns patterns uh, through data, which is called training, and then is able to give uh, a forecast based on the patterns that it has learned from the input data. So now I've given you a very basic overview of why we need OpenStaff, what is machine learning, but now I give the word to Bart to actually explain what is OpenStaff. Yes, thank you. So I will continue on uh, explaining more about OpenStaff. And one of the key components of OpenStaff is the prediction job. It's a useful uh, tool to store all the relevant information that is required for OpenStaff in a single class. And this can be information such as the location of the point you want to predict in the grid, uh, some identifiers and the name of the prediction job. It's also things like how, uh, how many uh, minutes you want to predict in the future. There are also quite some other things you can give to such prediction job, and you will actually find out yourselves during the, uh, during the workshop notebooks, as we will uh, then make one ourselves. And then using these prediction jobs together with the input data, you can then call the uh, aforementioned uh, fully automated machine learning pipelines of OpenStaff. And this is one of the uh, key selling points of OpenStaff as it makes um, the complex task of machine learning quite easy as a pipeline contains all the necessary steps that are required to make a forecast or train a model. And so these steps contain, for example, uh, data validation, feature engineering, training a model, making a forecast, uh, also evaluating such forecasts and even some post-processing steps. So all these um, required machine learning steps, they are all uh, combined within a pipeline, making it quite easy to perform the task. And so, for example, we have separate tasks for, of separate pipelines for uh, training them, um, a machine learning model uh, where we do data validation, feature engineering, and then train a model, uh, and also one for making a forecast and some others, as you will experience during the, the workshop later on. And so a bit deeper into how these, uh, these steps actually work within OpenStaff. Uh, when you use OpenStaff, you want to predict a target, which is usually the load on the grid. And you provide some external predictors that makes, uh, that allows OpenStaff uh, to make the forecast, such as weather forecast, uh, market prices, but also typical usage profiles of large types of customers. And OpenStaff will then automatically um, derive features from the uh, predictors you provide, such as the lagged load and derived weather features and even some calendar info. And then using this input, um, you can call the, the train model pipeline to train a model. And after having a trained model, you can then create a forecast. And that's um, a bit high over how uh, OpenStaff works under the hood. But I talked a lot about features and maybe it's a good idea to explain a bit more what features now actually are. So for example, the input features you provide uh, in the category of weather uh, forecast can be wind speed or temperature or solar radiation or, or wind direction. And then OpenStaff will automatically um, derive some features from this, such as the uh, global tilted radiation, um, humidity or vapor pressure, as these are apparently all good predictors for um, predicting the load on the grid. Then for the market prices, this can be in the case uh, in the Netherlands for short term forecasting the APX. So that's the Dutch day ahead uh, energy market price. And then the typical usage profiles, those are um, typical, well, typical usage profiles of a large type of customers as they usually have a certain type of load uh, which can be used as a feature. And then the date you provide with the uh, timestamps, um, OpenStaff will derive from this whether the date you want to predict is a holiday or a weekday or a weekend day. 
as power usage usually changes uh, uh, between those types of days. And then finally, you provide the historical load and then OpenStaff will derive the, the lag load from this. And I already saw a question in the chat about what the lag load means. It means um, what the load was at the earlier moment. So for example, if you predict the, uh, want to predict um, the load somewhere in the future, in the future, the lag load feature could be what was the load seven days ago or one day ago, or even 15 minutes ago, depending on how far you want to predict in the future. As you usually see that, um, the load is quite a repeating pattern. Um, and OpenStaff will use all those features to train a model. And then depending on the, um, depending on the, the location or the, the load you want to predict, it will automatically assign some kind of importance for each of those features. As some features are more relevant than others for certain locations, for example, here you see a feature importance plot, which means uh, that a feature with a large square uh, has a high feature importance and the low square has over low low size square is a low feature importance square. So you can see that T minus seven D has a quite high score. So that was the load a week ago. That was quite important. And also the wind power fit extrapolated, which is a derived feature from uh, wind speed. Um, so this indicates that there's quite some wind behind this location. When you look at, um, for example, here, the, um, the radiation feature, you see that's a, quite a smaller square. So OpenStaff automatically uh, learned that there is not so much solar energy behind this location, but a lot of wind energy. So that's a really nice feature of, of OpenStaff, and it also indicates some um, uh, of uh, indicate some kind of explainability of the model, which is quite nice. Um, then another feature from OpenStaff is that it also provides quantiles, which can be quite difficult uh, to explain, but I will try to give a high level overview. Because the machine learning model is not always 100% sure of the output prediction it makes. For example, here we see a graph with the blue line being what is forecasted for load, and then the red line, what was being measured afterwards, and the green lines are the quantiles. And so you see that the prediction was usually quite good during nighttime, as that is quite easy to predict. And there you see that these, these green lines, these quantiles are quite narrow, uh, indicating a very uh, high confidence of the prediction that was being made. And during day, when there's a lot of varying usage and, uh, for example, uh, or more activity on the grid, I think that's a good way to summarize it, then it becomes harder to predict the load. And there you can see a wider interval um, indicating that the, the prediction um, could be a bit off, uh, which was also the case here. So that's um, some indication of the model of the certainty uh, of the prediction that's made. And then another thing that is good to discuss is you can actually have, when you look at the load, you can actually have a negative load, such as here in this, in this graph. And what that means for OpenStaff is that there is more production than consumption. So in this case, there would be more, more energy generated by, for example, uh, windmills or solar energy, then there is consumed by, for example, factories or households. Uh, so then you get a negative load. And uh, here you see a positive load, which means there is more uh, consumption than production at this location. So then you see the load being uh, higher than zero. And finally, I uh, also want to say that we from Aleander are not the only ones working on, on OpenStaff. It is really a community effort, and we have quite some companies working together uh, with us working on OpenStaff, uh, which we are very grateful for. And if you are also interested uh, into, into helping, uh, well, you can also join the community. Uh, we also have community meetings, and we will uh, uh, show that later on. If everyone can go to the 
collab page and give me a little thumbs up if you're there so I know everyone is following me. Yes, I see some hand showing. Some thumbs up. OK. So what we're going to do, we're just going to present or file, now depending if you have your Dutch or English notebook. Then you open and click on GitHub. So notebook, open notebook, notebook open for the Dutch speaking people here. Then you go to GitHub. Then what you do is you paste the link that Frank will send in the chat. Um, to the GitHub of the OpenStaff workshop over here. And it should look like this. Then you might be on a different, it's called a repository, uh, sort of a different folder in GitHub. So make sure that you're at OpenStaff slash OpenStaff dash workshop. Now it should look something like this. Has everyone succeeded in doing this? See a few thumbs up. Thank you for responding. Okay, if you're not succeeding, please say something in the chat right now. Okay, then we can go to the next step and that's actually opening the file. So in the list, you're gonna look for workshop dash beginner slash workshop one train a model low bar answers. So workshop one train a model and be sure that you're in the beginner else you're accidentally going to do the advanced notebook and that's going to be a bit difficult <laughs> okay then you just click this and it has opened don't be scared by this screen <laughs> i'll walk you through it so the first thing that we want to do is actually upload our data so hopefully everyone has done the preparation and downloaded the files so what you do is you go to files bestanden in Dutch. Um, so on the left toolbar, you go to files and then you click on upload uh, to session. And then you click on your data. So for me, it's still in my downloads of today. So I've done a preparation today. Um, so input data sendheavy.csv. If you downloaded the files, it's going to look like You're going to the workshop file, then data, but then you select input data sun heavy. So open step workshop data, input data sun heavy. And then you click on open. There's a warning, you can just ignore it. Hope you trust me uh, that I'm not letting you down with any crazy things. Okay. Did everyone succeed in uploading the data? There's a question by Rich. Yeah, okay. not yet, uh, but I think that's because Richard I don't have a, a collab account. Collab account. No, you, oh. you need a Google account maybe. Oh yeah, that's that's the problem. Yeah, when I press okay, the if button, you're it asks. Not succeeding at all. You can also just look at my screen and yeah, that's I'll, better. <laughs> you can look at in the the code that I've written. Okay, then I think we can start with the workshop part of everything. Um, OK, workshop part one. So in this part, we're going to learn how to train a model. Uh, and this entails what we just saw in the video, for example, that uh, the model takes a lot of data and learns the patterns that can be recognized over there. So that's what we're doing in workshop part one. So learning points, we're going to learn how a prediction job works. Going to see what data is required, 
we're actually going to get some experience with the train model pipeline. Uh, we're going to see that the model gets automatically stored and loaded. And we're going to see how to get information out of our trained model. So let's start with the prediction job. So as Bart has explained in the beginning of his part of the presentation, that OpenStep uses a prediction job. And the prediction job entails all information that we need uh, for a forecast. So I'll go quickly through the things that we need in our forecast. So the first information part that we need is which model we are going to use. So this is an open source machine learning model. So someone else has coded this for us. We don't need to do anything about it. And we store it in this line in the prediction job that I've just highlighted. What we also uh, give to the models which quantiles we want um, in our forecast. We tell them which forecast type we want and also the location, so the latitude and the longitude of our forecasting location. In this case, it's one of the islands above the Netherlands. We also tell the model which horizon we want, so the time horizon, how far into the future we want to predict. And we also say which, which increments, so how big are the time steps uh, for our forecast. We, of course, give it a name so we can find it again. And finally, we say with safe train forecast, we set this to true in order that our model gets actually gets saved, our train model, train model. But what I just explained is written in this code. So all the things I just talked about are defined in this prediction job. And I'll show you later on how we're actually going to use this. And then just to show you what's in this, we displayed the prediction job. So you can see over here what we are actually stored in this uh, in this part. OK, so another 10 minutes of me talking. So now let's get to work because it's a workshop. So we have talked a lot about data, so let's start doing something with data actually. So in OpenStep, we require a certain input format, which is called a data frame. Um, so we've given you this input uh, data, and I have three questions for you. So first of all, uh, what type of features do you see in your input data? Second, how much time is there between two data points? And finally, look at the plots for radiation and wind speed, and do you see any patterns? So I'll give you, let's say, five minutes uh, to work this out. No, sorry, <laughs> I see that I made a mistake um, because we actually forgot to run this code. So we've uploaded everything, but we haven't told the computer, computer to actually calculate everything. So what we still have to do is to click on runtime and then uh, alles uitvoeren or uh, run everything, run all. So please, before you uh, look at the questions, click on runtime and run all or alles uitvoeren, if you have it in Dutch. And you get another warning, also ignore that warning. <laughs> so this will take uh, a minute or something. I'm sorry I forgot to do this in the beginning. So what is taking a while to run is to actually install OpenStep. Everything else is quite quick. So I think it needs a little bit of a, mi a minute or something to run everything. Yes. 
Okay. So if you're looking on my screen, for me, everything is run as we're using the same server. It should take everyone the same time. Um, so yeah, these three questions. What type of features do you see? How much time is there between two data points? And look at the plots and which patterns do you see? So let's take four minutes to think about it ourselves. And then um, we'll answer the questions together. Uh, so little heads up, if you want to answer the question for everyone, uh, we would very much like you to. So four minutes. So again, if you already have the answer, just give me a little thumbs up or hands up in the chat so I can actually see if people are done. Thank you. Okay, let's look at the answers. So first of all, is there anyone willing to share uh, their answers with the group? So just unmute yourself and start talking if you feel like, if you think you can answer or partly answer uh, any of the questions. Uh, I can uh, answer some uh, questions. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, Sorry, I muted my laptop. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we see some uh, weather data, uh, radiation, for example, clouds, uh, wind speed, and the, uh, each 50 minutes there's a, a data point given. And 
yeah, the, the trends we see is that yeah, solar uh, generation is, a red, the radiation is uh, during the day, of course, when the sun is there. And in wind speed, there's not much of a trend. Yeah, perfect. Uh, 10 out of 10. There's one little thing I would like to add. Um, so here you can see all of the features that we use. And I think for most people, these type of features might be a bit confusing, like the E1, B, dash, AMI, dash, I. Um, so these are the standardized uh, patterns that we talked about in the presentation. So for example, an office is quite a predictable pattern. So at, at eight or nine, the office starts up, people work during the day and around five, it powers down. These type of profiles we also use as input features. Perfect. Does anyone have any questions about this? Yeah, from where's the data gathered about offices, et cetera? Yeah, these are standardized profiles that we um, have downloaded from FFF, MFF Boss. Um, so I think Frank can share the link where you can find this in the chat if you're interested. Okay, thanks. Yeah, of course. Anyone else with a question or a remark? Okay, if there are still any questions, you can always ask them in the chat and we'll get back to you. Because now we can go to the second part of our workshop. So this is actually the thing that we want to do in this workshop, namely training the model. So we have our prediction job, so we know all the things, details about our prediction. We also have prepared our input data above. So now we can start training. I've already written the code for you. It's over here. But I do have two questions. So first of all, I would like you to find out what actually happens in the train model pipeline. So that's the function that we're actually using to do train a model. So to help you with, find out what the inputs and outputs are. And we've given you a hint to our documentation website. Uh, and secondly, I would like to know what you think the reason is why we only use the train data as input. So that's a part of our input data set. So I want to know why we don't just use all of our input data. So I think we can take about four minutes to think about this. Um, and then we can get uh, go to the answers.
Okay. Everyone has had some time to think about this. Maybe look something up. Can anyone answer the first question? So what happens in the train model pipeline? What are my inputs and outputs of that function? Anyone wants to answer? Um, well, I can I can answer, I guess. Um, it's it's Thanks, all just there. Uh, although I'm not really sure what the PJ is, except for my pajamas maybe, but it's a prediction <laughs> job. So yes. I I have actually no idea how this uh, what this what this does. But uh, train data is obviously well the data you train the model on. Check old model. It says here that it's checking for if training should be skipped because the model is too young. Uh, and I guess that if uh, if the you don't want to train too often or it takes resources you don't want to use, so why why train if you have uh, have a have a model still existing? Perfect. Um, yes. And then some ML flow tracking URI. I'm not sure. I guess ML flow is some sort of a library that's being used or so. So maybe um uh this is i don't know I, i'm not really sure i'm just guessing uh and it needs some sort of a url to to allow it to track or yuri to, to allow it to track and then the artifact folder is basically i guess the output or part of the output because it also returns some values the train data the validation data and the test data which i'm not quite sure of so okay <laughs> that's well, you it. Got pretty close <laughs> first of all thank you for answering um, so let me start from the beginning. PJ, since indeed it's not your pajamas, uh, but it's the prediction job. <laughs> so the prediction job is what we defined in the beginning of the workshop. So in here, we stored all of the details of our forecast um, in one uh, variable. And the train date I already explained perfectly. So it adds to that. Checked old model age. You are indeed completely correct. We don't want to train every hour. So if we have a model that's quite young, we're not going to waste resources and do it all over again. And these two final inputs are actually the folders where we store our output. So it, on the left side here in the files uh, part, you can see that we have a new folder called MLflow artifacts. So machine learning flow artifacts and machine learning flow trained models. So in the artifacts, we have some plots, which we are going to discuss after this. And in the MLflow trained models folder, we actually have our trained model. Then you also pointed out that we have as an output train data, validation data, and test data. So if you want to train a model, it will use some of the data to actually train itself, some of the data to test how accurate it is, and a part of the data to validate. And in order to be able to backtrack this, it uh, outputs all of these three data frames. Perfect. Then maybe Geert, you can also answer, why do we only use train data and why don't we use the entire input data set that we've gotten? Uh, well, that's basically, I guess, the idea of a general uh, machine learning um, thing. You want to be able to, to, to check your, well, uh, a model uh, based on new data because if you're checking it on data it's been trained on it will have a 100 percent uh, score basically um which you want well <laughs> which would be cheating <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly that's the perfect answer if you already give the model the data that it's going to test on it's cheating it's just as giving uh giving someone an exam including the answers um yeah perfect thank you for answering then we're ready to go to the final part of this workshop. So we've now trained a model, uh, but it's also quite nice to actually see what we've done. So that's what we're going to do in this part, analyze our trained model. So we have three questions and I'm gonna uh, split them up. So as I already said to you, uh, we have a folder called MLflow artifacts in which we have stored a few uh, plots. 
However, because we are using Google Collab, it's not really uh, wanting me to plot this in the Google Collab file. So probably you have the same as me, localhost refuses to make a connection. <laughs> so therefore I've opened the files on my own laptop and I'll show, just show them to you on my screen. If you're working with Visual uh, Studio Code, you can uh, uncomment these and they will just open in your web browser. The last three lines, uh, four lines, sorry, of the uh, code. So let's look at the first question. So we have a fe feature importance plot, which we also showed to you uh, in the presentation. So let's think a minute about uh, if all the features are in the plot, why or why not, and which feature is the most important. So this is my feature importance plot, if you can see it on my screen. So one minute to think about, can you see all the features? Um, although some are really small, um, and which ones are the most important? Okay, hey, can anyone answer the question? So do you see all the features that we saw in the input and which features are most important? According to the to the how far the square is, I suppose. So, T minus 15 minutes. Uh, what happened in the last 15 minutes? And uh, this AMI, I don't know. It's the I don't know what that is. Yeah, it's one of the standardized profiles. Just what I talked about about the offices. This is one of the standardized profiles. Okay, so the most important features are the one with the biggest blocks. So indeed, uh, the weird acronym, which are the standardized profiles. The lagged load, so this means the load 15 minutes ago. Uh, and also whether there are clouds or radiation uh, are also important. So from this, I know that I'm in a location where there's a lot of solar energy. So this is something that as a grid operator, we do not know for every location, but as OpenStep is very good at recognizing patterns, it can deduce uh, that this is actually a location where we have a lot of solar power, thus radiations, and whether or not there are clouds uh, is an important feature. Okay, then the second question, which time horizon is more accurate? So we're predi predicting both 15 minutes and 47 hours into the future. So the difference between those is that some data you don't have two, two days ahead. So if I'm predicting today or Sunday afternoon, I have no idea what the load is between now and Sunday afternoon. So this information is unknown. Um, and I'm wondering what does that do to my accuracy? So what I will do is I will zoom in on a specific part um, of my plot. So here you see a plot of my uh, trained model, the data of my trained model um, for the entire data set. So let's zoom in 
on this part for 47 hours ahead. Let's put that on one part of my screen. No. And now let's also look <laughs> at the other. No. At 15 minutes into the future. So let's zoom in about the same part. I put them next to each other. See that I put it. A little bit of a different part. Okay, let me zoom in for December 3rd till December 10th, so a week. And my question is what differences do you see? And why is this? So let's think about it for a minute and then discuss uh, the answer. Okay, does anyone wants to share what they think the difference is between these plots? Yeah, I can uh, I can say something. Uh, yes, it's... you see you see for the smaller horizon that the uh, Predicted values are closer to the actual values than uh, for longer horizon. Yeah. Okay. Maybe explain to everyone how you can see this difference. The the do, the green dotted line is more on the normal green line than on on the right plot than on the left. Yeah. So what the actual value is the normal line, and the dotted line is what we actually predicted with our model. And so if we are closer to the future then it's easy to get it right perfect answer thanks okay then final question um i kind of answered it already before so seeing who pays who paid good at close attention where is my trained model can anyone tell me where i can find the model that i just trained You can also share in the, in the chat if you're really shy about talking in a, in a big group. Okay, so it is here. So in my MLflow trained models, OpenSAF automatically is able to store uh, your trained model in the folder over here so that you never lose it and it's always easy to find. Okay, with this, we've already come to the end of the first part uh, of the workshop. And so we've still two parts to go to, so please stay. Um, let's take until 10 past to get a little break, refresh our brains, and then we'll start with part two. So see you in four minutes.
Okay, everyone, it's time to continue. Um, so we're now continuing to workshop part two, which is to actually make a forecast. So what we've all been waiting for, we're going to do right now. So I'll share my screen again uh, so that we can start together. So again, just go to Google Collab, uh, collab.research.com. Give everyone a minute uh, to get there again. And then again, we just open the same way as we've done with the workshop part one. So you go to file or bestand, notebook opening, open notebook in English. And you get the same screen as before. We again just go to GitHub and fill in the URL, URL from the open staff workshop, which uh, Frank will share again uh, for the people who have lost it. Uh, somewhere in the process. Then this should be your screen again. Please give me a thumbs up if you are there. Or raise your hand or give me some sign uh, <laughs> that we're ready to go. I see some hands. So where we're going to go now is workshop dash beginner, workshop to make a forecast. So we just click on this to open it. If you're not there, please give a shout in the chat. I think everyone is there as no one is chatting. OK, great. Then we can start. So the first thing that we have to do again is to upload our input data. Unfortunately, in Google Collab, you cannot store it. If you're working on your own device, you still have it there. So you go to Upload to Session. And again, in Open Step Workshop, Data, you just select Input data, sun heavy. So in OpenStef dash workshop, you go to data and you upload the input data, sun heavy dot CSV. Get a warning, just ignore it. Please trust me. Um, so while that is uploading, I can actually explain what we are going to do in this workshop. So in this part of the workshop, we're actually going to make our forecast and hopefully I can show you how easy it is to make a forecast with OpenStep. So if you did not succeed in the previous workshop, do not worry, we have you covered. Um, it's going to, going to be fine uh, in the next part. What you're actually going to learn in this workshop is that you have some hands-on experience with using your trained model. You're going to learn which data you need to make a forecast. You're going to see how you can use the forecast pipeline, how an, a model gets automatically loaded, uh, and actually how you can compare the predictions, so your forecast to the measurements, what actually uh, has happened. So my data has loaded because it is over here, and the circle here is almost round. Um, so now. This time I won't forget, we're actually going to run our code. So <laughs> at runtime, you click on uh, in Dutch, alles uitvoeren, and English is going to say run all. You can also do control F9. And now it's going to run everything. One thing is going to take a little bit of time, and that's actually to install OpenStef again. So give it a little bit of time. In the meantime, I'll just talk you through the steps where we don't have to do anything yet. So first of all, just as with the previous workshop file, um, we have to define a prediction job. So this is uh, a dictionary in Python, again, where we can just store all of our details about the prediction. So this is the exact same thing 
as we did in the previous part. So I won't explain it all over again. The same as that what we had to do uh, for training our model. In this case, we also have to prepare our input data. So again, we have to split it into testing and training. We already covered this a little bit. Um, and what we also have to do here is to set the load. So the thing that I actually want to forecast to NAN, which means unknown. So the data that I'm actually going to use to make my forecast, I delete my load values. And these are two aspects that I actually want you to think about a little bit yourself. So first of all, why do we split between uh, training data and test data? And the second question is, why do I need to set the load to NAN, so unknown values for the data I need I use to make my forecast? So let's take um, a minute or two to think about these questions. Okay, I think we've all had a little bit of time to think about it. Um, so does anyone uh, want to share their answer to these two questions? If not, I'll just answer them myself. Um, maybe the next one, uh, someone can share their answer. So first question, I think we already handled this in the previous um, part of the workshop. So if we um, we train our model on the training data uh, and then we test on the testing part, because if you give a model the entire data set, it's just like giving a student an exam with the answers. So we train our model on the training part. So now we have to make our forecast on the testing part. I hope that's clear. And then for the second part, why do we set the load to NAN? Well, the load is actually the thing that we want to predict. So if we give our forecasting model uh, already the answer to the question they have to answer, it doesn't really make sense. So by removing the load uh, values, we actually give the model that we just trained a blank slate to actually make the forecast. I hope that's clear. I don't see anyone raising their hand, so I think it's clear. And then we can go to the interesting part, actually making our prediction, so making our forecast. So we have our prediction job. We've defined that before. 
and we have also trained a model and we have prepared our input data. So as we've done these three steps, we can make an actual forecast. So the code to make a forecast is actually only these six lines. So I hope you agree with me that's quite easy to make a forecast with OpenStaff. This line is just uh, referring to the folder where you can find the trained model. So we, in the last part, we trained the model and stored it in the MLflow trained models folder. So the exercise, first of all, what kind of input do I need to make a forecast? And secondly, I would like to know how long it took to make the forecast. So let's take uh, two to three minutes to think about these two questions. If you want a little bit more of a challenge, you can see, uh, look at the pipeline which we used on the OpenStaff website, which we've linked in the documents. So two minutes to do this. Okay, everyone's had two minutes to think about this, around two minutes. So can anyone answer the first question? So what is the input I need to make a forecast? Um, uh, basically, again, the, the prediction job, so the same parameters we used before. Um, then um, the the data to base your forecast upon. So that's the two forecast data. We just explained that this uh, was um, basically the values were nulled of month um, before, and uh, or the sorry the load <laughs> data was not before the rest not of course, and then the 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 place where your model was stored previously. As in uh, what's that in five or six or seven step five six seven above I don't know and then uh, the time it took was apparently seven seconds yes for me for me <laughs> yeah no perfect uh, so that's the perfect answer so to add so a little bit in the two forecast data we do have all of our features so we have our wind speed we have our radiation we have the standardized profiles the only thing that we uh, put to unknown to so NAN uh, is our uh, load data. But thank you for answering, uh, Geert. Perfect. Now we can get to the interesting part, which is to inspect the results. So we've made a forecast. Now look at what it actually looked like. 
So you can see that we have a table with our forecast. So the first column are actually our forecasting values. However, to make it a little bit easier on you, we've also made a plot with the forecast um, and the actual load. So the blue line is what we forecast, and the red line is what actually has happened. Uh, and below, you also see the relation between your radiation and your forecast and the relation between your wind speed and your forecast. OK, that's quite a lot to look at. So let's see what we need to answer uh, with these plots. So first of all, I would like to know when the model is accurate and why it is less accurate and why. So which moments in time is my red and my blue line close to each other? And when is it quite far apart? And the second question is to look at the weather features plotted and to see if you see any correlation between radiation and our forecast and wind speed in our forecast. So let's take about four minutes to look at this. So I hope everyone has had the time to look at the results. Is there anyone who would like to answer this question? Well, if the, the model was accurate and when not, um, sorry if there's a lot of background, the trainees are talking a lot. 
Um, I thought it was like when the load is quite low, then the forecast is actually quite accurate. But when uh, the load is a little bit higher or the, uh, the use of power isn't that, that as much planned uh, during the day, then the forecast and the load is not the same. So the, the, yeah, the, the planned use of electricity during the night and just things that happen every night the same, um, then forecast is better. Yeah, thanks for answering, uh, Koen. So that's actually a good answer. So during the night and when the load is quite low, it's quite easy for us uh, to make a forecast. Especially during the peaks, there are little things that are, that are quite difficult to predict. Um, and therefore, it's diff more difficult to predict these peaks. So perfect answer. Thank you, Koen. And do you always, uh, al always see like that the forecast is lower than the um, actual load? Or can that also differ in different days? Yeah, it can also differ in different oh, okay. days. So it's just um, this one. Yeah. In yeah. this case, indeed, we're a little bit below, but sometimes we're also a little bit above. Yeah. Um, and in case of congestion management, you prefer to be a little bit above it. Um, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. if your peak is higher than expected, things might break, uh, which you don't yeah. want to. Can you also ask, answer the second question? Um, Actually, yeah, I cannot. <laughs> I, I tried to see the correlation, but I couldn't really uh, discover one. Okay, no problem. So let me explain it then real quickly. So in the presentation, we saw that production are negative values in our system and consumptions are positive values. So in this case, we see quite a high radiation peak. So that means we have a lot of solar production. Um, so that means we are consuming our own energy more. So that means that our forecast is actually lower. So think about if you have solar panels on your roof, you first use your own solar energy before you take energy from the grid. So that's why with higher radiation, there's more solar power, more solar production, so less consumption for the grid. And especially in this peak, we see this perfectly, uh, perfect negative correlation. And then the second question for wind speed was a bit of a, an unfair question because um, the answer is that there is no correlation. So in the previous workshop, <laughs> I see Kuhn laughing, uh, in the free previous workshop, we already saw in our uh, feature importance plot that wind speed did not really occur. Uh, so this means in this location, we don't have that many windmills or wind farms. So there is no correlation between the forecast and our wind speed simply because we don't have that much wind energy. OK, then we have, um, I see a hand raised from Geert, is it? Yeah, yeah, so uh, so uh, a little maybe uh, a question or note on the, the first uh, plot. Yeah, uh, because you see the two, uh, basically the two powers. So it looks a little bit different at you than for me. But as Kuhn noted, it's 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 almost everywhere it's above except exactly where these uh, these radiation peaks are on, on which it uh, it goes a little bit below or well it actually looks to fit better but it, it in fact it so it doesn't fit better at that point but because it was probably uh, an expected radiation peak or something like that yes exactly that could be yeah cool yeah thanks for your notes so unfortunately we are a little bit tight in the time um so I'll uh, very quickly go over this part and we won't do the exercise such that we also have a little bit of a breather between this and the next workshop. So what we did in the last part of this workshop is to alter the input data. So what we did is we divided our solar uh, our radiation by 10. So in this line you see that we multiplied our radiation by 0.1. Um, and what that does in the results is here we see the blue line is the radiation. Our red line is our forecast as we had before, so with the full radiation. And the green line is our forecast where we only have 10% of the radiation. So here you see perfectly um, that if we have a lot less radiation, our forecast will forecast a higher number just because we have a lower solar production. Okay, we have a bonus. 
you can do this in the break if you want, but you're also very free uh, to take a little break. So the last part of the workshop will be a little bit shorter. Uh, it will be only about 15 minutes till the closure. So let's take three or four minutes, just a very short break, take a breather, and then we'll back at, well, let's say 1540. Did you see my question in the chat, Renita? In a personal, uh, yeah, okay. Yes, thank you, Gunal. I'm answering it right now. I'd like to get in on this. I think Kuhn uh, asked a very good question <laughs> and Lucas also wanted to join in. Um, so load uh, Kuhn said that the load was actually higher in this plot. And this is actually correct. So we have a uh, lower solar production. So if you just take a house, the solar panels on our roof are not producing as much. So this means that we need more energy from the grid. So therefore, if we have less solar production, more consumption from the grid, so our load is higher. Yeah, but the load was like higher than the forecast, but that's negative, right? Because then we cannot um, like um, if you watch at the congestion management, if the, the, the load is higher than the forecast, then it's then we are in trouble, right? Eventually. Oh, you mean the first plot? I thought you were. Yeah, the first plot. Yeah. That. Yeah, the first plot. Um, well, let me share. So the model wasn't actually um, perfect yet. No, or, the model okay, is never yeah. it's never perfect. Yeah. But shouldn't we build in more uh, more safety then? If the 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 difference between the load and the uh, forecast is that big at uh, at the uh, exactly the wrong moments, like at the peak moments. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect question. So, uh, in the presentation, you saw that we are using quantiles. So that means how certain we are that the forecast is below a certain value. So yeah. quantile of 90 means that we're 90% sure that the value is below. Okay. Yeah. In locations where we see that we are just less accurate, we will steer based on uh, quantiles where we are more sure that we are below the value. Yeah. And can you also like adjust the uh, parameters if you're seeing that the forecast and the actual load is uh, a big difference? Yeah, if we see, uh, especially for Aleander, if we see locations where we are off quite a lot or on weird moments in time, we actually investigate this and see if yeah, there are things okay. that we should alter about our yeah. input values. Mm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks for your question. Okay, time for the final part of the workshop. So let's start by sharing, oh, not my Teams, but my screen again. So let's start by opening the third workshop file. So exact same thing as before. We go to file, open our notebook. We go to GitHub. It should already go to the same as we've opened before. If not, Frank will send the link, which you can put in over here. And then you click on workshop slash beginner slash workshop three perform a back test. So you notebook open, go to GitHub, answer open staff, and open 
from the beginner part, workshop three, perform a back test. Okay. You've not been able to do so, please send something in the chat. Okay, I think everyone was able to do this. The final time that we have to upload the data. So again, we go to the left uh, task, and then we go to Besanden or files in English, and then upload to session. You again uh, click on the file you want to upload. So open step workshop, data, input data, sun heavy, or wherever you've stored it. Let repeat open step workshop data, input data, sun heavy. And you click on open. Again, a warning, you can ignore this. Um, and then when this is uploading, I can actually explain to you what we are going to do in this part of the workshop. So we are going to make a backtest. And a backtest is an evaluation method uh, over a model. So a backtest is automatically able to uh, measure how well we are doing in, in training our model. Well, the first thing that we have to do, again, just as before, we have to define a prediction job. So I won't go over it again. I think this is quite basic. Secondly, what we do have to do again is to uh, load our input data. So this is the same file as before. Um, However, in this case, uh, our backtest already uh, is able to um, make testing and training data sets. So we don't have to split anything. We can just throw in our entire data set. Well, now we can actually perform the backtest. So in order to perform the backtest, we have to have a prediction job and we have to have the input data. So we can see that this is the code to make the forecast or the back test. Sorry. We can see here that I'm giving it two training horizons. So I'm asking the back test to predict both 15 minutes into the future and 47 hours into the future. I hope that is clear. OK, and now in my explanation time, the data has also uploaded, so we can actually run our code. So to run our code, we go to runtime, all is outfooder or in English, run all, and you can just click this. So now the code is running itself, and we can start answering some questions. So my only question uh, with performing the back test, I'm curious on how many pipelines I need to actually train a model and make a back test. So I think half a minute would be enough to think about this. So just look at the code and see how many pipelines or how many functions I actually need to both train a model and make a back test. Okay, does anyone have the answer for me? Should be a short answer. How many do I need? Maybe I can ask Lucas or Tisha, how many pipelines do I need? Is it just one because n volts is one? Uh, it is one, but not because of oh. n volts. <laughs> but thank you for answering. So we only need this pipeline. So train model and forecast backtest. And this pipeline is able 
to automatically train a model and then perform a back test for us. So this is one of the convenient things of OpenStep that we only need one function uh, and fill in the inputs variables. Thank you for answering. Um, then we can see that our uh, back test is actually currently running. So perfect time management. So we can look at the evaluation of the results. So below <laughs> the back test results will be plotted. So you can see here, it's actually still thinking. Um, and I would like you to think about when the model is uncertain and why, and what differences you see between the horizons. So we see here, here the horizon of 15 minutes and here the horizon of 47 hours into the future. Um, and we'd like to know uh, when you see, what difference do you see and why? And to give you a little hint, if you click like this, you can actually zoom in on the same time frame. Is the, the red one, the realized, is that the same as the um, uh, load in the previous uh, plots? Yes. So the like red the line actual is load, okay. Yeah, yeah what is actually has happened. And the blue line is our what we have uh, forecasted. Okay, let's look at the answers. Because uh, in two minutes, we actually already have the conclusion. Uh, does anyone have an answer for me? So what is the difference and why between these two plots? The first Thank one is more accurate again, like the 15 minutes compared to the 47 hours. So there is more errors in the very last one you have like this um it gives you how much the average error is and then you see that 0 0.25 is way lower than 47 and i think the reason is again the same as previously with the time horizon that it's just shorter um time steps you're predicting with yeah perfect so we see indeed that in the 15 minutes horizon that the quantiles or the certainty um are a lot closer. So that means we are a lot more certain. So perfect. And the reason behind this is that we just have more data 15 minutes ahead than 47 hours into the future. Thank you for answering uh, Richard. Um, so with this, we already conclude the workshop part of the workshop. So I want to thank you all for bearing with me. I hope you enjoyed yourself. So hello everyone. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to see everyone again. So all the people from the beginner group should also be joining this call again. Um, for the conclusion of the workshop already, uh, time flies when you're having fun. I hope everyone had fun during the workshop today. Uh, so let's get into it. So <laughs> I can imagine that I hopefully you've learned a lot uh, today about OpenStaff, but we're also curious if it didn't, did indeed was the case. So you can answer in the chat, what did you learn? Did you learn what you were expecting to learn? Uh, and are you able to explain what OpenStaff does right now? 
can answer in the chat or even think about this for yourself. We would really like to ask you to fill in the survey. So you can find a QR code on the screen, so you can just scan it with your phone. If you're afraid of QR codes um, or you prefer just to have a link, Frank will send the link in the chat. Uh, oh, he's Is already sent it in the <laughs> chat. So please fill this out for us because it's really useful to get some feedback. Especially from uh, since this was our first time giving the workshop. So any feedback is really welcome. Yes. So thanks in advance for filling out our survey. So I can also imagine that well, you've had this workshop, you've really enjoyed yourself, but well, what to do now with OpenStaff? Well, luckily we've only showed you a little bit of what OpenStaff is able to do. So we have an entire list of things that you can actually continue with. If you want to have a more of an introduction, I would really recommend starting with our example notebooks, of which the links will also be shared in the chat by Frank. So then, this is the time for us to thank you for joining our workshop. If you have any questions, you're still really able to send them in the chat but you can also send us an email and our email address is shown on the slide right now. Yes, so thank you for, uh, for joining. Yeah, and hopefully see you next time. Bye. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye.